Thank you for joining us. In fact, the participation is on such a large scale that the conference opening has had to be moved um, to this room since our own premises would not have been um, large enough to accommodate everybody. The second part of the conference title, a unique encounter at the United Nations in Vienna, sparked my curiosity. UNIS Vienna is part of a worldwide network of UN information centers of the United Nations Department of Public Information. We serve four Central European countries, Austria, Hungary, Slovakia and Slovenia, with the mandate to promote public knowledge, discourse and support for the work of the United Nations. Doing this would not be possible without partnerships um, with academic institutions, with UN associations, with civil society organizations. And so I'm very pleased to see so many familiar faces um, here today. And in this particular regard, our encounter um, is fortunately not unique in that we do have the opportunity to work together um, with many of you on a, on a regular basis. What is indeed unique is that over the next two days, located here at the Vienna International Center, we will have the opportunity to debate some um, very central human security issues in a constellation of experts from within the UN family in Vienna and from the academic world. Um, and also in the same constellation, um, to look at the challenges involved on a daily basis um, in making the connection between the United Nations um, and the universities and the classrooms. Um, so I would like to thank the Academic Council on the United Nations System for this very timely and indeed unique initiative. Thank you very much. Distinguished guests, dear colleagues. In theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. This is a quote that is variably uh, attributed to Yogi Berra, and Albert Einstein. I don't know which one really is the origin of that. But it's a very, very appropriate uh, quote, I think, for, for uh, a conference like this. Because when you talk to practitioners, they say that their work is very much one damn thing after another. There is always a new specific task to solve quickly, preferably by yesterday. Uh, and there is a little time to reflect. For academics, there is plenty of time to reflect. There is a totally different time frame. Uh, and we want to produce generic knowledge rather than solve a specific task. But in order to theorize, academics need to draw on the experience of practitioners at the same time as theory can be a good but often neglected guide to action for practitioners. To use another quote, there is nothing as practical as a good theory. That's what the German psychologist Kurt Levin once said. Um, my organization, ACONS, the Academic Council on the United Nations System, is trying to be a meeting place for academics and practitioners and to foster exchange between, uh, between uh, the two and encourage research and teaching on international organization. And in, that, in, in doing so, promoting a dialogue between academics and practitioners. Uh, in my experience, when you talk to people in academia and to practitioners, both sides want intensified interaction, yet it seems fairly difficult to realize. What then is needed? And that is what we are going to discuss these two days. I think I, I, I'll just mention two key words, meeting places and exchange. This gathering is an excellent example of the kind of meeting places that are needing. 
Uh, we organize annual meeting, meetings in, in Aikens, which is also a, a forum where practitioners and academic, academics meet. The next one will be in June in, in Waterloo, Ontario. And uh, I hope to see many of you there uh, as well. Let me also mention that we have a journal called Global Governance that I think many of you are very familiar with. But it's a, one of the few journals out there which is both academic and is open to contributions from practitioners on various uh, uh, issues of international organization and, and, and global governance. There are these meeting places, but we all realize that much more is needed. We need to ha get a culture where uh, academics uh, have a habit of inviting relevant practitioners to their conferences at the same time as relevant academics are will be invited to meetings of international organizations. Not to forget all the possibilities, possibilities today of virtual meeting places, something I think which can be developed much further. As for exchange, Aikens at one time had a, an ex exchange program where academics could spend some time in an international organization and vice versa. Unfortunately, it fell out of use for, mostly for lack of time and also lack of funding. But I think we need in this field more in and outers, so to speak. People who can move uh, to, uh, and spend time in both environments, both the academic and, and the, the organizational environment. And I say so uh, not only in terms of research, which is perhaps the thing that you think of first, but also in teaching, uh, uh, where, uh, where we've had completed something called the Bologna process in, in European higher education, where one of the key words is Employability is a new word. Employability. Our students should be employable. And in order to be employable, they have to be exposed to the job market uh, during their education. In other words, there is a need to involve practitioners in teaching. And I think that for students in international, interested in international relations, very often they're their first thought is to get into the foreign ministry of their own country. Uh, and I think maybe representatives of international organizations should appear in the classrooms to show that there is this uh, uh, job market out there which uh, needs to, to uh, attract uh, gifted students. So, I would like to see more representatives of international organizations in the classroom, and perhaps also more academics in the training or in, uh, of I, uh, international organization personnel. Anyway, I look forward to this opportunity to exchange ideas concerning how we can improve interaction between practitioners and academics. And I'm very encouraged by the large turnout, which indicates genuine interest in these questions. The annual meeting of this year of ACONS, if I'm not wrong, will be about uh, multiple multilateralism. I think this is the title of it. It's at Waterloo. When I was thinking about symbolism, I was wondering who is the ascending power and who is the descending power <laughs> at Waterloo. Uh, when we speak about multiple multilateralism, my understanding is that it's a web of multilateralism at different levels, at the level of the G20, G8, P5, for some there is a P2 emerging as well. Today I would like to speak about something which I would like to characterize like 190 plus I'd like to speak about multilateralism at 190 plus, all-inclusive multilateralism. And uh, I would like to make practically three points. 
Point number one, that multilateralism at 190 plus is doable. Point number two, it works. And to steal from Nike, just do it. This will be the, the third point. And let me, uh, first of all, make a general point. Uh, those who might say that multilateralism is the descending power at 190, I would like to challenge that notion. I would like to challenge the notion is the passé. I would like to make a strong point that it's the future. If we could put the next slide, please. Thank you so much. Uh, this is another way of bringing to you what I call a family photo of all those countries which lined up behind the prohibition of nuclear weapon tests. You will have to uh, add up two numbers, 153 and 29, to realize that by now there are 182 countries who subscribe to the norm, be it through ratification or signature, to ban the bank, to ban the bank forever, for all environments, and for everyone. That's important against the track record of the idea emerging in 1954, Nehru, going through the 1960s with the partial test ban treaty 1963, coming to 1996 when the treaty negotiated and reported out, and being here where we are in 2011 with 182 countries. It is doable. It has been a dream for a long, and we are 80%, 80% green with this uh, map. The double part is the 80%. The challenge part is how to convince the nine remaining countries whose signature and or ratification is needed for entry into force. DPRK, North Korea, India and Pakistan, they will have to sign and ratify the treaty. US, China, Iran, Israel, Egypt and Indonesia, they will have to ratify the treaty for this dream to become final reality. But as you can see, we are on the right track. This map, just 10 years ago, looked much less green. There were two dozen countries who by that time ratified the treaty. So you can see the robust progress the international community is making to turn the double into something more permanent. Next point, multilateralism at 190 plus, 190 plus works. And if we move to the next slide, I would like to show to you what we call our verification system. Without being lost in details, because my colleagues were nervous how far I hijacked some of the points from the afternoon session. Without being lost too much in the details, this system with around 380 monitoring facilities, listening hopefully to the silence of nuclear weapons around the world, with another 250 communication assets. Altogether, more than 600 facilities around the world, around the clock, to ensure that promises enshrined in a treaty are kept. They do not remain promises. Implementation. And uh, the question on your mind and the question on, on the mind of many of the godfathers of the treaty, uh, how it works. And by now, uh, this blueprint, which was uh, crafted back in 1996, is 80% reality as well. Together with 182 countries, an organization managed to build 
this unprecedented verification system. This is fusing four technologies, monitoring technologies, connecting 90 countries with all those stations and providing verification data around the globe and around the clock. The amount of money is one measurement, one billion dollar investment in this system. 10,000 scientists years invested in that system. And this system can be, yes, can be created. This system, yes, can be operated by an as diverse group of people as you could see on the first photo. And this system can deliver products. And there were two unfortunate products during the last 10 years when the uh, DPRK detonated the nuclear device back in 2006 and in 2009. Multilateralism, multilateral verification works at the level of 190 plus. And it works probably better at this level. Let me explain why. Number one, having monitoring stations, the sources of verification on the territory of 90 countries means that there could be no shadow over the verification information gathered. No one can speculate that verification, raw information coming from 90 countries, from all those monitoring stations can be doctored, can be massaged. Number two, why verification at the level of 190 plus is good. Why it works? Because information is processed in an absolutely transparent way. Once we gather seismic hydroacoustic infrasound radionuclide information, we are making sense of this information and we are trying to identify whether an event is man-made or not, whether it's an explosion or not, and we are doing it in a transparent way where what we see is what you get. This is a monitoring terminology, but uh, let me apply this monitoring terminology. Everything appearing on the radar screen of this multilateral verification implementation organization is shared real-time or near real-time with all those 182 members who wish to do so. It's all-inclusive. The information is important for verification, the information is important for tsunami warning, other civil and scientific application. So this ultimate transparency puts verification at the level of 490 plus at its best level. The next slide might reveal to you two points. Don't be lost, there are 300,000 dots on this map. Uh, this is the task for this organization. In 10 years, there were 300,000 earthquakes, tsunamis, blasts in landmines, accidental explosions in oil depots and ammunition depots around the world. What this verification organization with nearly 190 members had to do was to figure out which were those activities which did not respect the Tesban Treaty. There were only two, fortunately only two, or if you wish, unfortunately still there were two. We as an organization, and this is to uh, again uh, demonstrate it works, we managed to find those two small dots, two small needles in a haystack of 300,000 events. Those were, if you see the magnitude dots, magnitude uh, four type of dot, it, it's on the bottom. But we managed to do that, and we, we managed to show to members of this all-inclusive arrangement that yes, if they are small countries, if they are sitting on the Security Council, they are on a level playing field 
with the P5, with other countries who might have more enhanced, more developed means of getting verification information. And this all-inclusiveness of getting information and all-inclusiveness of being empowered to take a political position is absolutely important. The other message from this map is that it works for tsunami warning. Um, we, as an organization, are the fastest, most uh, reliable, and highest quality raw data provider for tsunami warning. Last point, going beyond the nuclear weapon test from 1945. You don't have to be lost in, in numbers. This is like reading history. You don't have to be a historian to read history. Uh, for example, 1962, this, this tower of nuclear weapon tests in 1962, this is coinciding with the Cuban Missile Crisis, where we were globally, collectively close to a total security meltdown. 1961, another peak, the, the, the Berlin uh, crisis period. You can read the ups and downs, the roller coaster of history for the last couple of decades, uh, the ups uh, going up in the late 1960s still, and then mid-1970s detente, the and then going back again uh, late 1980s, uh, again a, a peak around 1980 uh, with, with Afghanistan and uh, with all the other developments in history. And then it's coming back uh, at the uh, 1990 period, again a free fall, uh, the end of the Cold War. What is the message uh, from uh, this map is there is a correlation between nuclear weapon tests, banging going on, sometimes uh, like in 1961, there was a 60 megaton nuclear device detonated, which sent the airwaves three times around the globe. The airwaves travel three times around the globe. This is about sending messages to each other. And you could see that the 1962 messages were practically spinning out of control. There is a correlation between countries trying to pursue a competitive race for security instead of a cooperative approach to security. And this is where, as one of the elements, the test ban treaty can make a difference. We don't need messages like the 1962 messages, or we don't need messages like the uh, end of the 60s, uh, end of the 80s, uh, sorry, end of the 70s type of, of messages. Just do it means that uh, it's important to pursue security, not from a, not from a national point of view, because it leads as it is clear, to competitive races, which, which, which can spin out of control. And this is where the Test Ban Treaty, the organization which demonstrated that it can do its work, can help. It can help, and let me have a different interpretation of, of these three numbers. I used these three numbers earlier to demonstrate that multilateralism at 190 plus works. Let me give you a different interpretation of these numbers. Let's take one standing for security. There is only one undivided security. Pursuing security in the national context will eventually lead to less security. It's like with trade. If countries are trying to maximize their trade benefits, it will lead to protectionism and less trade. It's exactly the same. If it is accepted for trade, why not to accept it for security? There is only one security. Nine, we have nine countries 
who still will have to share the notion that there is only one undivided security. For the CTBT, those nine countries who are still to sign and or ratify the, the treaty. D0 is the time we should waste. The treaty is there with dotted lines for those nine missing. The verification system and the regime is, is there. I tried to demonstrate uh, to you. So what is needed? A realization. A realization that things can go wrong. And without being too dramatic, did anyone believe in a dot-com bubble before the turn of the century? Few did. It happened. I can continue with bubbles. I can continue with the housing bubble, prime rate bubble, trade, exchange rate. Some are speaking about food. Some are speaking about employment. Some are speaking about a, a new generation as a, as a bubble as well. We do not believe in bubbles um, until it might be too late. So the question is whether there is a need to prevent the type of bubbles building up or not. Whether countries share the notion that action is needed. And if the realization is sinking on, that is, instead of explaining after a bubble is burst what went wrong, we better invest. And my strong point is that we have to invest in multilateralism and 190 plus because it works. Thank you so much for your attention and looking forward to the continuation of this meeting. Thank you. I will do my best uh, to um, also address you with a message. And the message is uh, that uh, we need to educate, prepare young people for a very complex world. Now the Diplomatic Academy in Vienna, despite its name, is not a training institution uh, for diplomats, but is an academic institution preparing some 150 students every year for international careers. Careers in the service of internet, the international community. About 15% of our students go on to serve in international organizations. And about 30% of our students go on to serve in their national diplomatic or other public uh, services, uh, which of course obviously uh, involves very often also multilateralism. Like other institutions, uh, we of course emphasize very much our comparative uh, advantages. I mean, this is a very natural thing. If you are a private institution which depends on success, uh, then you have to maintain a very high quality and you have to emphasize those things, those advantages that distinguish you from other institutions. And one of the big, one of the big advantages of the Diplomatic Academy is that it is situated in Vienna. Now, not only is Vienna, uh, I'm told, I'm a Viennese, so I'm a little biased, uh, I'm told that it is not an unpleasant city to live in, but more importantly, uh, it is a very international city, and it has become one uh, in the 70s, as we all know, because uh, it, is, it serves as headquarters to a great number of international organizations. And of course, the Diplomatic Academy uh, in Vienna uses this advantage very much. But 80% of our students, in the course of their studies, which usually, usually last for two years, it's a classical Bologna master program that we offer, work in one of the international organizations in Vienna uh, as interns. Not very well paid, I'm afraid to say, but uh, nevertheless, we're full of enthusiasm and they take with them an experience which is invaluable for their later career. I believe that 
what uh, Mr. Jensen uh, said, this combination between theory and practice is the most important aspect of education for international careers. So we try to balance, on the one hand, theory, and on the other hand, uh, practice. And if I look around here in this room, and if I look at the list of participants, and of speakers, and of panelists, uh, rather a great number of them are teaching at the uh, Diplomatic Academy as practitioners or as theoreticians, as professors. And I think this is very important. The other important aspect of teaching the United Nations, of teaching multilateralism, is interdisciplinarity. We must not stick just to one angle of an issue. We must look at all the angles. And this is why interdisciplinarity is a very important uh, part of uh, training uh, at the Diplomatic uh, Academy. We try to give an overall view. And this involves not only looking at international organizations at the United Nations system as a system which needs to be understood, its functioning, the legal basis, uh, the way it functions in practice, but also the subjects uh, with which uh, international organizations uh, are dealing with. It would make no sense just to study the Charter of the United uh, Nations. Of course you have to do that, and we're very proud and lucky to have uh, one of the big masters uh, of uh, the uh, Charter of the United Nations, Larry Johnson, to teach at the uh, Academy. But you have to look at the various subjects that international organizations are active in. And if you look at the organizations in Vienna, then you see there is a wide variety of issues, of global challenges, of issues that need to be dealt with. Uh, we have just heard uh, from uh, Mr. Todd uh, about uh, his field of activities, which is in extremely important for the future of mankind, I would say. But there are others, other areas uh, of international activities here in Vienna, international uh, non-proliferation, disarmament, international cooperation, development cooperation, human rights, human security, all these are issues, the fight against terrorism, the fight against uh, organized crime, uh, energy security, all these issues need, need to be looked at from a multilateral point of view through the lenses of uh, international organizations and this is exactly what we are trying to do at the Diplomatic Academy. I find, uh, and I congratulate you, uh, that you have organized this meeting because bringing together young people, students, future generations that will be active in the international field with uh, well-established practitioners, with those who practice uh, multilateralism, uh, is a great experience for both sides. And I am sure that this conference is going to be extremely successful, as were the previous ones, and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. I guess some of the previous speakers spoke about the purpose of this conference of how to improve interaction between academics and UN practitioners. And what I would like to talk about today, had this happened a month ago, I would have been here welcoming you as the director of the UN Information Service, because as Michael said, I'm now the director of the outreach division in the Department of Public Information in New York, which launched recently in November, officially uh, by the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, something called the United Nations Academic Impact, which I would like to focus on today. What is the academic impact? It is basically sharing a culture of intellectual social responsibility. And it goes around 10 principles. Uh, maybe we can, what the presentation will, will uh, involve is a background on the UN academic impact, the 10 principles that it talks about, membership partners, first steps that have already taken place, and looking ahead. If one looks at the United Nations, uh, Ambassador Todd talk, spoke about 192 member states, and it was established as an organization of member states. But I always remind people that the first words of the charter are we the peoples. And when we talk about we the peoples, the peoples are more than the states, I mean more than the governments. 
And my division or the division of outreach in DPI tries to work with the elements of the civil society. And so far, historically, the United Nations from the very beginning was working and started working and dealing with non-governmental organizations as one representation of the civil society. In the second term of Kofi Annan, he also launched something called the Global Compact, which dealt with relations with the private sector and how private sector companies and multinationals, which now account for a great deal of economic activity, uh, can also work with the United Nations by adopting certain principles with which they can become associated with the United Nations. The UN also, the Department of Public Information, works with the university students on model United Nations. And, and here we have started a global model United Nations, which the first was in Geneva two years ago. This year, it, in 2010, it was in Kuala Lumpur. And this year, it will be in uh, Korea. Uh, the Creative Community Outreach Initiative was another initiative that aims to interact with another element which is the creative community, film and television industries. And just last week, I was in uh, Los Angeles with the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, where we attended an event with the global, called the Global Creative Forum that brought together filmmakers, producers, directors, actors, goodwill, goodwill ambassadors. And the notion in this initiative is that while the Secretary General can speak to kings and prime ministers and presidents and foreign ministers and interact with them, his messages and our press releases can go so far. But a goodwill ambassador, people who are celebrities, who have a great deal of outreach, they can get the messages about the work of the United Nations and the values that the United Nations stands for to a much, much larger community. Just by way of example, Last year, after Haiti, uh, the earthquake struck Haiti, the UN prepared a small film about the crisis and the needs, humanitarian needs in Haiti. It was put on the UN YouTube website. It had about 6,000 hits. The group Lincoln Park, uh, I personally don't know them, but I guess my children do, uh, they were impressed and they wanted to do something to help. They put it on their website. And within a week, it received six million hits. So you can see the difference, and this is some of the things that we try to do with the creative community. Now, academic impact. And this is, again, maybe the missing link. The academic impact is an attempt to also involve and create a link which will facilitate, maybe uh, become the framework for long-term interaction between the academic community and United Nations practitioners, but also between the academic communities themselves and how to share ideas and actions. The 10 principles, uh, maybe it's the next slide. The objectives, as the Secretary General launched it, uh, the first event related to the economic impact was actually in September 2008. This is when he came up with the idea. And then the Department of Public Information, my department was tasked with developing the concept. In, the introducing, in the, his introductory remarks, uh, this is a direct quote from the statement by the Secretary General, it is often said that the, if the United Nations did not exist, we would have to invent it. I fully agree, and that is why we have to strengthen its capacities on each of the three pillars of the United Nations work, peace, development, and protection of human rights. Part of that effort means continuing to open our doors to new partners. The academic community is surely at the top of that list. My colleagues and I have been discussing an initiative called Academic Impact, and we hope to build stronger ties with institutions of higher learning, and we hope to benefit from your ideas and scholarship. That was in 2008. Officially, the Academic Impact initiative was launched in November at headquarters uh, by the Secretary General himself, and here you see the link to uh, the website where you can get more information. I was hoping to bring a lot of these leaflets and publications related to it, and the boxes are delayed in the pouch. If they arrive today, you can have them tomorrow. Otherwise, the information and material is all downloadable from that, that website, and you're welcome to do so. Next slide, please. The objective, as I said, 
basically it tries to align institutions of higher education, scholarship, research, and that I guess includes the academic, uh, diplomatic academy uh, with the United Nations and each other to address priority issues with which our world is faced. It does, not, it does that by offering a viable point of contact, as I said, ideas, uh, initiatives relevant to the organization's mandate and furthering their own direct engagement in or contribution to relevant programs and projects. And here, this chart, it was developed actually by Handong Global University in late 2010 as the envisioning the 10 principles on which the academic impact is based on. And these 10 principles, participating institutions who become partners or members of the academic impact have to more or less undertake one activity relevant to one of these 10 principles each year. A commitment to the principles inherent in the United Nations Charter as values that education seeks to promote and help fulfill. A commitment to human rights, among them freedom of inquiry, opinion and speech. A commitment to educational opportunity for all, people, for all people regardless of gender, race, religion or ethnicity. A commitment to the opportunity for every interested individual to acquire the skills and knowledge necessary for the pursuit of higher education. A commitment to building capacity in higher education systems across the world. A commitment to encourage global citizenship through education. A commitment to advancing peace <coughs> and conflict resolution through education. A commitment to addressing issues of poverty through education. A commitment to promoting sustainable sustainability through education and a commitment to promoting intercultural dialogue and understanding and the unlearning of intolerance through education. These are the 10 principles which I think most academic institutions do agree on and would not find it difficult to undertake one activity relevant to one of these, if not even more. And you can check on the website that I showed before whether or not your academic institution is already a member and maybe you can undertake one of those activities directly. And if your organization is not, if your university is not a member, maybe you can try to uh, follow up and make sure that it does become a member. Since it was launched, can you next slide please? Uh, so far, 572 members have already joined the United Nations Academic Impact from 98 countries, and that is as of 18th of February, about 10 days ago. Uh, and that growth is in, in less than six months. And the, maybe you're not able to see the, where they are coming from, but if you go to the next slide, this is, this is the uh, growth from July 2010 up to today. And the next slide would show you the geographic distribution. And here you will note that where we found it very important to come and participate and present the academic impact in this forum is that Europe, even though uh, I'm sure there are more than 17% of the world's universities are in Europe, uh, we are uh, not well represented. Europe is not well represented and I think this is an opportunity for universities in this region to uh, focus and try to join this initiative. Uh, you will see that 43% uh, is from the Americas uh, already, from the 540 uh, members. Next slide, please. Uh, joining members, membership, the, the university would receive a member certificate, uh, which is, uh, this is a, a sample, and I guess my colleagues uh, by, by coincidence picked up the one that was actually sent to Vienna at the UN University, and it's signed by the Under Secretary General of the United Nations uh, Department of Public Information. Uh, we also have, as everybody talks about social uh, networking and, and social forums, there is a Facebook page. Uh, on the UN Academic Impact. Next, next slide. Uh, and that already has 2,427 friends. And one of the Academic Impact uh, members or partners from China set up a page in China, which, next page. <laughs> this is the growth in the face page usage, but next page uh, is in China. China, then again, Within a matter of days, it has 1,000 uh, people liked it, and it, it is now also going in that direction. First steps 
the UN Economic Impact had a pre-conference in Shanghai in China uh, in 2010, November. Uh, that uh, also uh, had the participation of the Secretary General of the United Nations. The, that conference had 200 participants representing 80 plus universities and organizations dealing with higher education and research particip uh, participated in the pre-launch. It was conference, the conference was opened by uh, our Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and uh, closing remarks were de delivered by Mr. Kiyo Akasaka, the Under Secretary General for Communications and Department of Public Information. In his concluding re remarks, and he said that it is our conviction that the principles inherent in the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are universal values that education can promote and help to fulfill. There can be no alliance more formidable than that between scholarship and social responsibility. We call upon academic institutions, in particular universities, to embrace intellectual social responsibility, as an increasing number of business corporates embrace corporate social responsibility. In our quest to realize real solutions to the real problems of real people, we call on the highest motivation and qualities of academic achievement. And I think this is another call for universities here to uh, reflect and see if they can uh, join the uh, initiative. Again, uh, the official launch, next step, a slide please. This is the official launch of the academic impact in uh, New York on the 18th of uh, November. And the, uh, just again, these are quotes from the Secretary General uh, when he launched it. Uh, you can see that's the uh, official launch. There, there was a, another conference in Centro Niemeyer in uh, Aveles in Spain, December of last year. That was the first European uh, conference related to the UN Academic Impact. And that, again, was focusing on three panel discussions, architecture of peace, education, human rights. And it doesn't mean that this was the first one in Europe, that it has to be the, sec the last one. I think we can work together to uh, maybe have more conferences focusing on the uh, other themes of the 10 principles. These are some of the projects as I said, that the universities who become members have to undertake to do at least one activity related to one of the ten principles. These are just examples of the projects that have already been undertaken by a number of universities around the world. And you can see from China, Tanzania, Japan, uh, Japan, uh, University of Nairobi, uh, Melbourne, Australia, uh, Handong Global University, and Marymount College uh, on the MDG week. And in addition to help further, of course, the 10 principles, one of the ideas came that there would be 10 hubs of, for each of these 10 principles and a call to volunteerism went out to already member organizations or uh, universities and the ones that came forward and said that we would be the hub for this principle uh, are in the next slide. So. If you look at this, the uh, different countries and different universities that have undertaken to become a hub for the, uh, one, each one of the ten, it's based on the expression of interest and, and of course this is uh, trying to be geographic, covering uh, different parts of the world. Um, I'm nearly done. <laughs> Looking ahead, uh, also just black, uh, just again, uh, conferences that are coming ahead. The Global Hub Black Sea University Network, and that will be in uh, Ovidios University of Constanza in Romania, 16th to 19th of March, 2011. You'll find more details about that on the website, and I think that also uh, you can participate. The next event will be in Korea, uh, UN Academic Impact Hub, Handong Global University in August, 2011. That will also be attended by the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. Uh, the other conferences that are coming up in China, October 2011, Lebanon in, in also October, late October 2011, and Morocco in uh, October, November 2011. 
The academic impact also works with the Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, the regional commissions, and I'm just going fast here because I know that we are pressed for time, but I, as I said, the presentation is available to, to be given out as a handout, and all information is available on the website. We're trying to work with partner organizations in the UN system, as you can see the next slide. Uh, next slide. UNODC, uh, Children and Armed Conflict, Special Advisor on Africa, Commission on the Status of Women, and other organizations. We're trying to work with them to, to bring, again, what with this conference is trying to do, bringing practitioners with the academic community. Engaging with students, uh, you, you saw in the first slide reference to ASPIRE. ASPIRE is action by students to promote innovation and reform through education. And again, here we're trying to involve the students in the same uh, way that we involve uh, academics. We have a communication strategy that uses the website and made more or less Facebook, we have now Facebook, and at some stage we will be using other uh, social media tools to get the message across, and our target is to uh, reach every single country and to have the membership continue to grow throughout. I don't uh, assume there are, there's time for questions, but I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be here different parts of the day, and anything you, you would like to ask, if I'm not around, you can send an email to the uh, address shown, up, shown there, academicimpact at un.org, uh, but uh, check the website, you might find the answer already there. Thank you. I really do not represent academics or practitioners, I represent basically corporate world. Uh, for many years I have been heading Xerox in India, and. Uh, which was part of Dr. Modi's group, and now, uh, later part, I have decided to do some more work related to passion. So, uh, looking at uh, Spice Foundation, which belongs to Dr. Modi, uh, which has also uh, conceptualized a global university. So, I am here basically uh, representing Dr. B.K. Modi, who is my boss, uh, chairman of Spice Group, and uh, he is one of the leading Indian industrialists. Uh, involved in development and delivery of high technology products in the areas of information, communication and entertainment. Uh, Dr. Modi, whose accomplishment involves degrees in engineering and doctorate in finance management, really regrets very much that he cannot attend this meeting of the UN academics and practitioners personally, although he very much intend to do so. Uh, notwithstanding his absence, the interest in our attending this meeting should still be emphasized as those representatives of the private sector who took beyond corporate responsibilities and fulfilled social obligations toward the humanity at large. Uh, Dr. Modi, myself and many others want to see the world as one family and promote formal education in urban areas, informal education in tribal areas, a quality health care for the needy, and a holistic approach towards global peace and understanding. We are the part of global business that advocates greater cooperation between different cultures, faiths, and traditions. Therefore, the SPICE Foundation, chaired by Dr. Modi, whose offices are located in uh, various parts of the world, including London, Dubai, Shenzhen, Singapore, New York, Los Angeles, New Delhi, and Bombay, has organized many international seminars, conferences, and roundtable uh, conferences, led global peace pilgrimages of more than 300 peacemaker, peace leaders, to 45 cities across the world. Uh, in this context, in which the global university project I manage in India factors into the agenda of this meeting. In short, this new privately funded university to be opened next year will offer, uh, apart from various commercial faculties like engineering, management, etc., uh, will also offer a holistic education. The initial funding of this project involves about $160 million uh, to kick start this project. We find this meeting a timely and appropriate event because it gathers so many interdisciplinary academics and practitioners from the western part of the world in which its oriental part is interested and hopefully vice versa. This is what we understand 
under the holistic education and the dialogue of civilization emphasized by the United Nations General Assembly, which we plan to pursue at the Global University to be opened at the city of Rampur in the Indian northern province neighboring Nepal. Probably we will be the first one to uh, link it with the United Nations program in these universities. Uh, this particular part of the country has about 190 million inhabitants, which is equivalent to what sixth most populous country itself, with almost one-tenth of GDP of India. I have given you a very brief, some basic parameters of the project conceptually, culturally, and geopolitically, and invite your questions later. How best the dialogue of civilization can be operationalized through the global university? Finally, and in line with the above objectives, I would like to inform you that the SPICE Foundation will support conceptually and financially the organization of an international conference uh, which is being scheduled in New Delhi on justice and security reforms uh, sometime uh, early December next year. This ECONS conference to be held in early December 2012 will be yet another initiative to develop the dialogue of civilizations and turn into the result which the United Nations may wish to demonstrate to the whole world. Thank you very much.